Rosanna, thank you for talking to me. Sure. Can you tell me where within the law LGBTQI people stand? Well, as you know, in Sri Lanka, um, homosexuality is still a criminal offence, and this is a penal code that was brought in by the British many hundreds of years ago. Well, not hundreds, but quite a few, you know, decades ago. Um, and for some reason or the other, you know, uh, Sri Lanka has been clinging on to these old colonial laws to penalize people just for being who they are. And I think it is a, a ploy by successive governments to undermine certain members of society so that they can control and be voted into power over and over again. So you'd find that there are a lot of issues for example, with the Prevention of Terrorism Act, which is still in effect, even though the war is now over five years. Yeah, five years. And, uh, you know, still people can be taken on that, uh, on the pretext that they are aiding and abetting terrorists. Has anybody been imprisoned? For aiding and abetting terrorists or for homosexuality? Homosexuality. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, and that's the funny part of it. Uh, since this, uh, since independence, actually, uh, there has been no convictions. Nobody has been to prison um, on 365A, which is the sodomy law uh, in Sri Lanka. Now, that sodomy law, and I say 365A because it was originally 365, and it talked about you know carnal intercourse against the order of nature by any male person with another male person, making it very strictly a homosexual thing. But in uh, 1995, they amended the law. Uh, the Ministry of Justice at that time thought it was gender biased and decided to drop the word male, thus opening it out not only for lesbians, but also for heterosexual people as well. However, in this country, heterosexual people are above the law as far as that is concerned. It's only homosexuals uh, and lesbians and transgenders who are you know, discriminated against and targeted because of this law. Is there a difference between the way that lesbians and gays are treated and transgender people are treated? You know, if you ask any individual from the LGBTIQ community, each one of them will, you know, tell you stories that will raise hairs on the back of your neck. So, by and large, I believe that all of the uh, LGBTIQ community is discriminated and violated just the same. It's just that some people may be, you know, able to blend in better uh, into heterosexual mainstream, so are not as targeted. But certainly, I would not pick one from the other because I think they are all, you know, pretty much facing the same issues as each other. What is the attitude of the authorities towards LGBTQI people? Well, you know, it's hmm, there are some people who are obviously very open-minded and you know are willing to change, and then there are others who you know toe the party line and you know definitely want to see LGBTIQ people further discriminated and so on and so forth. Uh, I think the most amount of issues that uh, the LGBTIQ community face is from the police and from their families. So. As far as the government is concerned, we've had a couple of breakthroughs, uh, like last October, for example, at the ICCPR review of Sri Lanka. Um, the government did make a statement saying that LGBTIQ persons are covered under Article 12 uh, of the Constitution, which refers to equality, or you know, all persons are born equal, that kind of story. Um, and that 365A actually is a law that doesn't apply to any one group. Now, this is kind of strange because all this while it was meant to be a sodomy law, it was meant to be against homosexuality. But making that statement shows very clearly that that law now includes heterosexual people as well as LGBTIQ people. It's just the interpretation of it by the judiciary which might be a little bit different than what the government is saying or what we say. Yeah. Do you see that as progress? I do see it as progress. Um, there are people who say, oh, you know, the government might just say that, but they're not going to do anything about it. True. But considering the government has never said anything like that before, I take it as a plus rather than a minus or a negative. Um, one of the other things that happened earlier this year in March was that Sri Lanka for the very, very first time voted against Russia at the Human Rights uh, Council in the UN 
um, I think there was a resolution to allow same-sex couples working in the UN to have you know, benefits as the same as heterosexual couples. And Russia did not like it, of course, and they wanted it scrapped. But uh, of course, that resolution from Russia was beaten. And thanks to Sri Lanka for voting in favor of the you know, of uh, same-sex benefits rather than uh, voting with Russia. What is the situation with regard to LGBTQI tourists visiting this country? If they come in and say the customs stop them, and in their baggage it's found they may have gay and lesbian or transgender literature, could they get into trouble or will a blind eye be turned? Well, you know, it depends on what kind of the literature it is. Um, porn, naturally, is going to start all kinds of bells ringing at customs. But I think they need to be really be careful because, unfortunately, uh, especially where DVDs are concerned, anything, you know, uh, homosexual or gay is viewed as pornography. Um, books, not so much, but, you know, if it has explicit pictures and stuff like that, yes, of course they're going to get into an issue, yeah? So, best not to bring any. You were telling me about a British man who had been on a dating site or dating app. Can you tell us a bit about him? Yeah, uh, he was having um, some really horrible messages sent against him and his um, profile uh, was targeted and, and so on and so forth. So um, these are just one-off situations and you know there's not very much you can do about it. For example, uh, there are Facebook sites that really talk some utter rubbish about equal ground, the work it does, me. I'm apparently the chief pedophile in the in the in the island, you know. So these these Facebook sites, we have tried to get Facebook to shut them down to no avail. So I think there's a certain amount of risk that everybody takes when they are on uh, you know the internet because the internet is you know full of predators waiting to you know pounce on somebody who has just let their guard down and we don't even let our guard down we still we have our photographs poached from our own facebook pages from our website and you know how they photoshop it to make it look like all kinds of strange things so all i have to say is you know i mean you have to be careful who you are interacting with and dating sites especially are prime targets for predators so can you tell us a bit about the background of Equal Ground and your own involvement with it? Sure. Um, it kind of started in a very roundabout fashion because I actually was involved with uh, being a founding member of a women's group, uh, which was the first group to you know, work with lesbian, bisexual women and trans men, and um, found that it was very exclusive. Um, and there was also at the same time another group uh, that was dealing with just men, you know, um, gay and bisexual men. And uh, there was nothing that encompassed the entire LGBTIQ community. So at the same time that that was going on, I was also the co-secretary general of ILGA. Um, and I was able to make a lot of contacts and I was able to see what was going on around the world as far as, you know, the movement and the kinds of organizations that were, you know, flourishing in other areas. And I thought uh, that would be a good idea to start an organization that was not only all encom encompassing, but also leading by example, uh, all inclusive. So we also include heterosexual allies and friends in, and in our membership. And that, you know, drew a lot of flack from the LGBTIQ community when we st first started because they wanted to know why we need to include, you know, heterosexual people when they have their own safe spaces. And I had to explain to them why. Um, and it has worked really well, you know, to have all these people involved because, you know, um, I don't think any movement, if you look at it, even the anti-apartheid movement or the civil rights movements in the States, I mean, it wasn't only about black people, you know, wanting their rights. It was everybody getting together and, and fighting for the rights of, you know, people who are being marginalized just because of the color of their skin. So, um, And you yourself spent some time in the United States, didn't did, you? Yes. What lessons can we learn from organizations over there here in Sri Lanka? Well, I, I really think that one of the main things is that we need to have professionalism in whatever we do. We can't merge the personal you know, with the business. 
um, I think it has been a big mistake, not only in Sri Lanka, but in many other places in South Asia, as well as everywhere else, where, you know, everybody is just like into everybody else. And, you know, the lines get blurred and then it starts, you know, falling apart. The two organizations, for example, that I spoke about earlier are no longer in existence in Sri Lanka. We are now the only LGBTIQ organization uh, working on advocacy uh, in Sri Lanka. You are a woman who is the in charge of equal ground. Within the LGBTQI community, have you experienced any form of misogyny? Oh, absolutely. Uh, patriarchy is uh, very well alive and well in uh, the LGBT community here as well. Uh, Sri Lanka as a whole is a very patriarchal country and misogyny is like, you know, second nature to most men in Sri Lanka, unfortunately. Um, and I've actually, the, the, the most amount of hate and, and you know, death uh, threats and whatever have come from within the LGBTIQ community from gay men. So it's sad, um, but I just take it in my stride because I just think to myself, well, you know, buddy, if you can do it better, why don't you start an organization and do it better? So that's all I have to say about that, you know. Is there a difference between the general population and politicians, do you think, with the attitudes towards LGBTQI people? Hmm. Yes, I believe so. I think the general public, I think they, uh, you know, ac they're more accepting and more tolerant in general. But it's the politicians with their, you know, hidden agendas of trying to control their water base that, you know, really, you know, push these attitudes to the people. Like, for example, this singular Buddhist only attitude, which was very prolific uh, during the Rajapaksa government, you know, it was a hateful uh, you know agenda which split the country um, Sinhalese versus the Tamils versus the Muslims and you know it, it most people you know have really good friends uh, on different levels with all of the different ethnicities I mean I grew up in a Sri Lanka where my classmates were Tamil, was Berger, were you know Muslims, were you know expats, whatever, and we never thought them as different. But it's the ideologies that are forced down our throat. Now, a person like me or like you, we not we, we won't buy that kind of crap, yeah. But the masses buy it, especially because we were having a separatist war, and it was easy for them to push that agenda. Then you know. To what extent does your organization work with, say, organizations of a similar background in India or Bangladesh across South Asia? Well, for the last probably seven to eight years, we've been uh, very uh, involved in like South Asian uh, regional uh, you know, networks. Uh, we are within a network right now as well, as well as previously. And so we're working very closely with the region on a number of things like documentation of violence, human rights, HIV, you know, shadow reports to, uh, you know, using different mechanisms of the UN, like the UPR and so on and so forth. So we're very, very much engaged with the regional. And, and Equal Ground is actually very engaged globally as well. Um, we actually have a lot of contact and a lot of networking with a lot of you know other organizations like for example we do a lot of work with Heartland Alliance uh, for Human Rights and uh, Human Needs I think it is sorry but and the University of Chicago Law um, we did our um, UPR with in collaboration with them I mean they did all the hard work uh, if you may, uh, Kaleidoscope Australia, for example, Kaleidoscope uh, in the UK. We are part of the Commonwealth, um, you know, group of uh, organisations. So it's like that. We are, you know, sort of tied into quite a bit of uh, uh, activism abroad as well, and, and on an international, uh, you know, arena. You recently organised a Pride Festival. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, I'm very proud of our Pride Festival. <laughs> it's the this year was the eleventh Pride. We started off by having a small pride party uh, in 2005 and uh, we had over 300 people, which was fantastic. And then we decided, okay, we're gonna, you know, broaden it. So in Sri Lanka, we can't do a parade. So we do the next best thing, which is, you know, have a festival of different, different events, uh, sometimes over a period of 10 days, sometimes maybe five to six days, and we've even done it for one month. So 
it could be stuff like fashion shows, drag shows, uh, dramas, uh, you know, film festivals, all these kinds of things put together and um, it has been very well received and so far, touch wood, we haven't had any kind of, you know, security issues. Um, there were a few slight issues in 2010, but we managed to overcome those issues quite uh, uh, easily. And I think that is actually thanks to the fact that we do a lot of prep work before and we make sure that the uh, venues that we choose are safe spaces. For example, um, the Goethe Institute, which is the German Cultural Institute, they have been our partners uh, in the last three or four years with the film uh, festival and also the art and photo exhibition. So that is German soil, basically. Um, and so, you know, it uh, precludes any kind of, you know, unwanted, uh, you know, excursions by unwanted people in there trying to hassle us. Uh, the other thing that we do is we make sure that it's open to heterosexual people to participate as well and the diplomatic community has been extremely good at uh, you know uh, being present at all of our events which gives us also uh, a measure of security by having you know international people there. Now one of the focuses overseas particularly in some of the western countries has been marriage equality. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't happen here in Sri Lanka. But where do transgender people stand with regards to marriage equality? Well, I have no idea. <laughs> I do know of some transgender people in Sri Lanka who have transitioned and who are in heterosexual marriages, legal heterosexual marriages. Um, but as far as you know, marriage equality is concerned, you know, this is not something that even crosses our mind here because we have to first get rid of criminalization um, and then we can think of marriage equality further down the line. But you know, as far as I'm concerned, personally, I mean, marriage has never been uh, my, in my focus or even in my thoughts because it was never a possibility for me growing up or living here in Sri Lanka. So I never really thought about, you know, marriage, but uh, I realized that, you know, it's all about equality. So I'm very much, you know, uh, for marriage equality. And so the thing is, you know, Australia still hasn't got it together. So Sri Lanka is a long way behind that. What advice do you have for somebody watching who in Sri Lanka who may still be in the closet, who doesn't feel comfortable coming out? Well, you know, you don't have to be flamboyant and come out in order to support the cause. And at Equal Ground, for example, we are very strict about our confidentiality and we keep, you know, your whoever's, uh, you know, uh, contributions at a, you know, a secret. We, we don't have to say who did what, you know, and helped us in what way. So we need everybody involved in order to make sure that the laws that are passed to protect us, that the law that is actually damaging us is changed. I mean, don't look for just equal ground to do all of the work for you. Uh, we are all humans. We are doing the best we can with what little resources but it really needs all of us to get together to push for this, not just one or two. Yeah. And people who perhaps don't feel comfortable coming out or, or who have issues, um, you offer a counselling service, don't you? Yes, we do. And that is in our 10th year as well. Um, we have qualified counsellors and we have particularly uh, focused lines for transgender persons and lesbians. And then the third line is for gender. So it's all, you don't have to use your real name. You, you can talk to people and, and you know, you can be counseled and it's a listening service. So we listen to what you have to say. And um, we get trained. So, you know, we are quite, you know, well, uh, what should I say, uh, informed about, you know, how to counsel people and what not to say and all that. I'm a lousy counselor, so I do not do that. <laughs> Yes. What kind of problems do people come to you with? Most of the time, actually, to tell you the truth, they want to know how they can change to become heterosexual. Which really? is very, very sad. Yeah. And is it true there are clinics here and doctors here who say they can change you to yes. heterosexual? Yes. Um, actually, one of our guys had gone undercover to one of those clinics and uh, came back to report that the doctor was a perv, you know, all he did was, you know, fondle the guy's genitals and, you know, hang magnets on his testicles and 
you know, do all kinds of weird stuff. Um, so I think that at the end of the day, it's not about, you know, trying to make somebody a not homosexual, but to make somebody go running and screaming out of their office, you know. So they're a bunch of quacks. A couple more questions. Do you find a difference between attitudes towards LGBTQI people in rural areas and the cities? You know, um, either way you'll have some who are tolerant and accepting and some who are extremely homophobic. Uh, you know, I find actually that uh, people in the rural areas are far better at understanding the, you know, the fact that people's rights are being violated because these people, because they're from villages and from poor communities, they have their rights violated all the time. So they understand perfectly when you talk about it as a human rights violation. So that understanding means that they are accepting, more accepting, you know, and more able to uh, live with others who are different. In the urban settings like Colombo, the big cities, um, you know, you, you do have a lot more visible uh, acceptance uh, and also this sort of uh, acceptance of LGBT people as long as they stay quiet and, and under the radar, that kind of thing, you know, we don't care what you do in your bedroom business. Um, so there's a lot of closeted people in Sri Lanka, um, a lot in the urban areas as well, especially in upper middle class and rich settings. Um, one of the unfortunate problems is that there is a lot of forced heterosexual marriages, you know, especially when parents find out that their kids are gay, they force them to get married. And, you know, it's just an unfortunate uh, situation for both parties in the end. So, Presumably there are no gay or lesbian bars. Presumably there are none at all. <laughs> Actually there's not. There isn't. But there are very gay friendly nightclubs and restaurants and hotels and, and various things like that. I mean, in fact, we are doing a lot of sensitizing uh, in the corporate sector and we decided that um, the hospitality trade would be the, the best place to start. So we are doing sensitizing programs with uh, hotels, for example, and we've done it with quite a few uh, local hotels. And in actuality, one of the biggest companies in Sri Lanka it's a homegrown company. Um, uh, it was an ex-British-owned company, um, but it's it's wholly Sri Lankan. With uh, you know, and they are in the hospitality trade as well as everything else. Um, and next month, they are going to be launching the fact that they are going to include sexual orientation and gender identity in their human resources policies. So non-discrimination and uh, you know, safeguard. What are your hopes for the future here in Sri Lanka? that everybody comes on board uh, with this kind of, you know, commitment by this company. Uh, and of course that uh, criminalization is taken away and that LGBTIQ people will be brought into the mainstream of society to be, you know, productive citizens like everybody else and not have to hide and feel fearful or shameful about what they are and who they are. How can people find out more about Equal Ground? Well, Equal Ground has its own website, trilingual website, it's the only trilingual LGBT website in Sri Lanka. And we have Facebook, we have Twitter, we have uh, a blog site. And um, actually the uh, website can give you all the information on how to contact us, uh, www.equal-ground.org. Uh, plug the organization there a little bit. Um, and, you know, Facebook, of course, which is uh, backslash you know equal brown in caps so there's a lot of uh, information going out and, and one can easily actually contact us just google equal ground and there you have it is there anything else you'd like to add um not really i think we've covered quite a bit but uh, i'm just happy that you're here and i'm happy that you're taking the message from sri lanka out there because i think sri lanka sometimes gets you know uh, glossed over uh, because, you know, Africa is always, you know, uh, the flavor of the month or, you know, India sometimes and maybe Nepal always. And so Sri Lanka gets sort of, you know, uh, neglected. Uh, but we have had some really harsh and trying times which we have hopefully come out of. And we really need everybody's support and, uh, you know, contribution. Rosanna, thank you very much. It's a pleasure.